This is muscle lecture number five, and in this one we're covering, or we're continuing with muscles in the lower extremity. We're gonna get into the knee, ankle, and toes. So uh, hopefully you've spent some time looking at a table like this, and maybe you printed it out and have been trying to fill it out. Um, this really tells you, is gonna tell you everything you need to know about these different muscles with respect to their functions. Um, so today, or in this video, we're gonna cover these, um, the knee, ankle, and toes. So the knee undergoes flexion and extension. There is no abduction or adduction in the knee. You don't want that to happen. Uh, remember that we've got the medial collateral, lateral collateral ligaments to stop these particular motions from happening. And surprisingly, we actually do have a little bit, just a little bit, but super important amount of rotation in the knee. Um, the ankle has certain movements as well, which we'll talk about, as well as the toes. So let's start off with the knee. When you look at the, the muscles that move the knee, probably two of the most famous groups are the quadriceps and the hamstrings. And so um, even elementary school kids often talk about their quads. Oh, my quads are burning when they're climbing upstairs or running a lot or something like that. So the, the name of the muscle group is the quadriceps femoris. And so quad means four. So that tells you automatically that there's gonna be four groups in there. You should feel pretty comfortable with the idea of muscles being arranged into groups because we've seen things like the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff is a muscle group of those four muscles, right? Supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, uh, as well as subscapularis. Well, quadriceps is also a muscle group. The quadriceps femoris, meaning right here at the femur, quadriceps femoris has these four muscle groups. Uh, rectus femoris, which is this one, it's the most superficial of the quadriceps muscles. And then you have three vastus muscles. The vastus lateralis, which is on the lateral side, the vastus medialis, which is on the medial side, and the vastus intermedius, which on this slide is hidden. It's actually buried right underneath the rectus femoris. If we were to peel away rectus femoris and get rid of sartorius and the TFL there as well, then here are the vastus muscles, vastus medialis, intermedius, and vastus lateralis out to the sides. So together, all four of these quadriceps muscles are gonna do the same thing. They're gonna extend the knee. This is as if you're trying to kick a soccer ball. So when you extend your knee out, the quadriceps themselves are working. The only one of those four that has an additional role is the rectus femoris. The rectus femoris is this guy right over here. And the rectus femoris will actually, he actually attaches over here to the ilium, to the anterior inferior iliac spine. And he comes on down and goes to the patella, just like the other quad muscles do. Um, and what the rectus femoris will do, he'll also flex the hip. So he does hip flexion as well as knee extension, but the other quadriceps muscles themselves are only going to extend the knee. Um, so if you look at the distal attachment, one thing that we should note is that distally, all four quadriceps muscles are going to converge onto a tendon. Remember what a tendon is. It's a piece of dense regular connective tissue that attaches muscle to bone. In this case, which muscle? Well, all four of these quad muscles. And what's the bone it inserts onto? It'll be the patella. And the patella sitting right here, remember that's the kneecap, which we're gonna call the patella. And from there, the patellar ligament comes on down and it attaches onto the tibial tuberosity. And so the function of the patella here really is to give some more leverage to the quadriceps muscles. If you didn't have a patella, then these quad muscles are gonna sit relatively flat on the femur um, and come down here to the tibia, and they're not gonna be quite as efficient or quite as effective at um, extending that leg. But with the patella, the patella here acts as what's called a sesamoid bone, and that allows an increased amount of leverage um, so that the knee extension motion becomes much more efficient, uh, meaning you get more extension for less amount of work from these muscles than you would um, if you didn't have a patella. So those are the quads. Um, if we flip to the backside, we've already seen gluteus medius and gluteus maximus when we talked about the hip, and that was done in that hip video. Uh, we looked at some of the adductors as well too, iliotibial band as well as gracilis. Um, the muscle group that is antagonistic to the quadriceps, and what does that mean again? It means it does the opposite motion. So extension is here, the opposite of extension of the knee will be flexion of the knee. And the muscle group that's gonna do that are the hamstrings. So the hamstrings, again, are a muscle group. There's actually three muscles in there. There, and they are biceps femoris, semitendinosus, and semimembranosus. So the biceps femoris is actually right over here. It is the lateral hamstring muscle, and the medial hamstring muscles are the semitendinosus, semimembranosus. We name it that way, lateral and medial, based on its position on the posterior side of the femur, as well as its attachment distally down here onto the muscle, uh, onto the bones of the uh, the leg. 
So the biceps femoris is going to come on down, and he'll actually attach to the fibular head. Bi, bi means two, right? And so that that's it's named that way. Remember, we had a biceps brachii in the upper extremity, biceps brachii. In this case, it's the biceps femur or biceps femoris because it's a two-headed muscle that attaches down here. And that muscle, um, like the rest of the hamstrings, is going to flex the knee. The semitendinosus and semimembranosus are right over here. And um, it, it's, it's, if you look a little bit more closely, if you zoom in a little bit, you'll see that this guy here, the skinny one inside, is the semitendinosus. And semimembranosus is this guy here, as well as this guy. He's a more membrane-like muscle that sits just deep to the semitendinosus. I, a professor of mine long ago described this as like a hot dog, semitendinosus, sitting in the bun, semimembranosus. Um, so these three together form the hamstrings. Now, all three hamstring muscles, regardless of whether they're positioned laterally or medially, all do the same thing. So proximally, they have a common origin, and that is the ischiotuberosity. I do want you to know that that all three of these hamstring muscles are going to attach proximally onto the ischiotuberosity. And when they come down distally, these two guys, semitendinosus and membranosus, are going to attach to the tibia. And this guy out here is going to attach to the fibular head, the biceps. Okay, so again, uh, because they attach to the ischiotuberosity, they actually will move the hip, and they're going to create hip extension. So now this is where we got to be very um, specific. If I say to you, what is the proximal function of the hamstrings? You say hip extension. If I say to you, what is the distal function of the hamstrings? You say knee flexion, okay? Um, if I say to you proximally, what do the hamstrings do? You say hip extension. If I say, give me a synergistic muscle, you're telling me, well, what other muscle does hip extension? And the most famous one here, of course, is gluteus maximus. So let's come further down south. So the plantaris is this tiny little muscle here, and he does a little bit of knee flexion. I really don't have anything else to say about him, except know him, and he does knee flexion, and that's all he does. Poplidius is this guy buried right underneath, and he has a really important function of internal rotation of the knee. And what that would look like, that would look like the tibia rotating internally. And that is this type of motion right over here. So you see that air arrow? Mm, the arrow kind of rotating in this way. So the tibia, this is the right side, of course, this is internal rotation of the knee. Now, obviously, there's not a lot of internal rotation. Um, it's just a little bit. But what that allows, internal rotation of the knee allows you to, another way people describe that, they describe that as unlocking the knee. And so if I were to say, hey, stand up and lock out your knees, then every one of you would stand up real tall and extend your knees as much as possible, almost like you're trying to get as tall as you possibly can. And so that is locking of the knees. And that locking also includes a, a slight degree of external rotation of the tibia on the femur. One more time, external rotation of the tibia on the femur. Internal rotation then is internal rotation of the tibia on the femur. And again, that's your so-called unlocking of the knee. So you got to have this movement in order to, to flex the knee. If you don't unlock the knee and you try flexing the knee, then really you're going to wreak havoc upon um, the menisci inside the knee. So this, uh, the way the condyles of the knee are shaped as well as the meniscus, uh, medial and lateral meniscus of the knees are shaped, um, we have that necessary rotation when we, when we want to flex or extend the knee. So that's the function of the, the popliteus muscle. Let's move further on down. If we go from the front side, um, we're now past the knee and we're now gonna look at the ankle. And so when you look at the ankle, um, let's start with uh, dorsiflexion. So dorsiflexion is this movement. Look, we're looking at the front. If you think of taking the top of your foot or your toes and bringing that up to your shins, let's say you're standing up and you're bringing the top of the foot up towards the shins, um, almost like you're trying to walk on your heels, that movement itself is called dorsiflexion, dorsiflexion. So uh, dorsiflexion is done by the tibialis anterior and a couple of others, but the tibia anterior is the primary one. So if we look at some of the other muscles buried right underneath there, we're going to see extensor hallucis longus. Well, the name kind of tells you what it does. It extends the hallux, and it's deep to the tibialis anterior. It extends the big toe. There's a smaller version of that, extensor hallucis brevis, which is down on the foot, and that's only going to go to the toe. So yeah, you see we're doing ankle and toes kind of at the same time because we can't get away from it. All the muscles kind of live in the same neighborhood. Um, extensor digitorum brevis is going to extend digits two, three, four, and five. And these are also small muscles down right here in the foot. 
Um, let's take a deeper look in. If we peel away some of the layers, there's tibialis anterior again. He comes on primarily from the tibia, and his tendon comes all the way down and attaches just to the underside of that medial cuneiform and the uh, first metatarsal. He attaches just to that underbelly there, if you look at the plantar aspect of the foot. So that's how tibialis anterior is going to create that dorsiflexion movement. He's also going to create inversion. So inversion is, if you're standing up this way, you can imagine um, trying to look at the inside or the bottom of the foot turning that in towards the midline that is inversion uh, so tibia anterior is also going to help you with inversion there's extensor halysis longus getting a better look at it and if you look at his tendon coming all the way down you see he goes only to the big toe so even if you didn't know the name of this muscle or if you didn't have any of this detail here if I were just to show you a picture of that muscle, say, hey, what does that muscle do? Doing that whole point A to point B thing, right? It attaches to point A and it attaches to point B. Obviously, fibula uh, is not going to go out to the big toe. There's just no way that that's going to move. But the big toe can come toward the fibula, and that motion itself is called extension. Fibulus tertius is this little guy here, and I wrote in here, you can ignore him. He's a minor muscle, and we're not going to spend any time talking about him. So coming back here, again, this is that, that broader view. This was the deep dissected view. If we go in a little bit deeper from there, there's tib anterior again, there's extensor halysis longus, and this is extensor digitorum longus. This guy comes over here. Um, extensor digitorum longus is not to be confused with extensor digitorum brevis, which is over here right in within the foot. Extensor digitorum longus is actually going to come all the way up from the tibia and the fibula, and you see his tendon go down here to uh, toes two, three, four, and five. At this point, you really should see some parallels to what we saw up in the upper extremity. In the upper extremity, remember we saw muscles that would flex and extend the digits two, three, four, and five, and the thumb tended to get his own set of muscles. And it's not different here that the big toe, extensor halysis longus, is going to get his own set of muscles as well too. Um, just because he's special and he's really the most important of the bunch. Uh, one of the things you can see from the side here is the fibularis longus. Fibularis longus is this guy, and he comes down and he's going to actually attach just underneath that fifth metatarsal. If we turn this guy and look from the lateral view, there's the fibularis longus again. This is another view of tibialis anterior. This guy right over here is extensor digitorum longus just underneath. You're only catching a, a, a bit of him because you'd have to peel away the tibia anterior to see him. Fibularis longus is here and watch his tendon tuck right behind the lateral malleolus and he comes on down along with fibularis brevis right behind the lateral malleolus and he attaches right to that side and underbelly of that fifth metatarsal. So what is he going to do? He's going to allow eversion of the ankle, eversion. So what's the antagonistic movement to eversion? That would be inversion of the ankle. You can see also that fibularis longus is going to contribute just a little bit to plantar flexion. Um, <clears throat> if we look here at the back, these are your calf muscles. And the calf muscles... Um, Actually, hang on just a second. Before we get there, let's let's peel away. If we go deeper, removing some muscle, there's fibularis longus again, and he attaches us underneath there. Um, so sorry, yeah, fibularis longus goes all the way to the first first metatarsal. It's the fibularis brevis that goes to the fifth metatarsal. So there's a correction from my earlier statement. Okay, fibularis brevis goes to the fifth metatarsal. Longus is going to wrap all the way underneath to that first metatarsal. Um, Okay, so now the gastroc and soleus, these are the muscles in the back. These are the muscles of the calf. And uh, the, super, the superficial muscle is the gastrocnemius, and the deep muscle is the soleus. And they're going to actually work together. So let's turn around and look from a posterior view. This is the gastrocnemius. You'll see he's got two heads to it. He's got a medial head and a lateral head. And these are, are, are pretty visible when people are wearing shorts, especially if they're standing up on their tiptoes. This is the muscle that you see kind of bulging out in the back. And so the gastrocnemius is going to do plantar flexion. And plantar flexion is the opposite of dorsiflexion, or it's the antagonistic movement to dorsiflexion. And so that would be like if you stand on your toes, if you're trying to stand on your tippy toes getting real tall, or if you're pushing on the gas pedal, if you're driving a car, then that is plantar flexion. So you'll notice at the ankle, we actually have two flexions. There's a plantar flexion and a dorsi flexion. Gastroc happens to cross the knee joint, and so therefore he contributes just a little bit to knee flexion, although for sure he's not a primary knee flexor. So can you name a synergistic muscle to the gastroc? So if I say to you he's doing knee flexion, can you name a synergistic muscle? What does that mean? It means 
What else does need flexion? And those would be the, the three hamstring muscles. If I say, can you give me an antagonistic muscle to that? Well, those would be the quads. On the other hand, if I'm talking about gastroc and how he does plantar flexion, can you give me a synergistic muscle? Well, there you'd say uh, fibularis longus does a little bit of plantar flexion as well. If I say give me an antagonistic muscle, then you'd say in that case, well, tibialis anterior then does the opposite movement, which is dorsiflexion. So now, if you look at gastrocnemius, look at his distal attachment. If he comes down and then he converges onto this tendon. Again, a tendon is dense regular connective tissue that attaches muscle to bone. And so this is the tendon of the gastroc and he comes all the way down and he attaches to the calcaneus. Uh, this is the posterior part of the calcaneus. Um, and this tendon here is the calcaneal tendon. So what's the difference between the tendon of the gastrocs and the calcaneal tendon? Well, it's only this. If we peel away the gastroc, buried underneath there is the soleus muscle, and the soleus muscle is a powerful plantar flexion. That's all he does. He has no knee flexion whatsoever. So what we'll see is that soleus muscle comes on down, and the tendon of the soleus and the tendon of the gastroc are going to come together to form this calcaneal tendon. That calcaneal tendon has another name. You might know him as your Achilles tendon. Okay, so the calcaneal tendon is also known as the Achilles tendon. Okay, if we peel that away, we can see some of the muscles in the back. Now, these muscles, there's three tendons that run right posterior to that uh, medomaleolus. And um, I had a professor a long time ago who referred to these guys as Tom, Dick, and Harry. So Tom, Dick, and Harry, if we t trace these tendons up, who is Tom? Tom is tibialis posterior, Dick is flexor digitorum longus, and Harry is flexor hallucis longus. So let's knock out some of the easy ones. Flexor hallucis longus, what does he do? Well, he's visualized right over here. And as the name suggests, he flexes the big toe. Flexor digitorum longus, what does he do? Again, as the name suggests, he flexes toes two, three, four, and five. Remember what we just said a moment ago is that the thumb, sorry, in this case, the big toe is special. So he gets his own set of muscles, just like we saw in the upper extremity with the thumb. Tibialis posterior is a fun one. This guy is this guy over here. He comes all the way down and he does plantar flexion. He's also involved in controlling pronation. So pronation itself is flattening of the foot. So pronation is flattening out of the foot. Um, so every time you take a step, the medial arch on your foot will collapse. You can go back to your bone PowerPoint where I have pictures of that, that medial arch of the foot. That medial arch lowers to the ground and it does that on purpose. Um, because that softens the, the blow, so to speak. So when your heel strikes the ground as you're walking, you need to absorb some of that energy. And the initial way we absorb part of that energy is through flattening out of the arch. It's almost like, again, if you jump off a step, then most of you, when you land, you bend your knees to soften that blow. If you didn't bend your knees, then it's a very jarring impact. You'll feel that all the way up your spine into your head as well too. So you bend your knees to soften that blow. Well, part of that um, shock absorption, so to speak, is the, the, the flattening of the arch. Now, what you want to happen is that you want that arch to be carefully lowered to the ground. Um, you don't want it to smash down to the ground. And that's what I mean here by controlling pronation. Tibialis posterior will contract eccentrically. It'll contract eccentrically to help lower the arch down to the ground. So, um, the words concentric and eccentric and isometric contraction, I believe we used the word isometric before, but these are different types of contractions. Isometric contractions are when the muscle length doesn't change. So it stays the same length. Um, and I talked about it a little bit, doesn't, oops, doesn't change. And we talked a little bit about that in the upper extremity when we talked about the biceps um, and how if you were just to kind of um, let's say you go to your car and grab the bumper and try to curl up your car. Most of us would not be able to do that, but your biceps would be working like crazy. That would be an isometric contraction. A concentric contraction, it, on the other hand, is when the muscle shortens as it contracts. And those are traditional muscle contractions. If you grab a cup of water and bring that to your mouth, then your biceps is flexing your elbow and your muscle is shortening as you do that. An eccentric contraction, on the other hand, is when your muscle contracts and the muscle itself actually lengthens. And so that would be like, let's say the, the cup is really, really heavy. And now you are carefully lowering that down to the table. 
Um, so the cup's at your mouth and you are lowering it down to the table so it doesn't smash or make too much noise. Well, your muscle is still working. It's still the biceps that's working as you do that, but that's an eccentric muscle contraction. So the muscle itself is lengthening. So uh, the tibialis posterior, when he contracts concentrically, you will plantar flex, you'll stand on tiptoes. Um, on the other hand, his, his more common function is actually to work eccentrically. And so that means he will actually lengthen as he lowers that arch down to the ground. Um, tibialis posterior is commonly the muscle that gets really hot and bothered in, uh, in medial shin splints. For those of you who have ever kind of um, done some running or long distance running, uh, shin splints are a very common injury. It's a repetitive use injury, and that really is tendonitis of the tibialis posterior. So there's a closer look at the tibialis posterior, how it attaches to the tibia, maybe a little bit on the fibula as well too. And so when that attachment gets all hot and bothered through overuse, uh, then uh, that's, that's your classic um, medial shin splint. Um, there's another view of, of flexor digitorum longus, remember of Tom, Dick, and Harry, flexor digitorum longus. And then there's another look at flexor hallucis longus, a clear look at him. This slide just shows you, if you want to pause that, um, well, you have the slides anyway. Uh, the, this just shows you another look from superficial to deep of all the posterior muscles of the leg. So here we are back at this slide. And so uh, you know that the knee does flexion extension. You know that there is no ab abduction and no adduction here. Internal rotation is popliteus. And external rotation, there's no muscle that actually does this. Okay. In terms of ankle, really the movement, movement here we are calling um, um, plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. Um, abduction, adduction, we didn't really talk about that so much because they, they're really not uh, significant movements here. But in the coronal plane, what we see instead are we see inversion, um, and inversion would be over here. And then over here would be eversion. So these are some special movements of the ankle. And there really is no rotational movement, okay? No rotational movement. And at the toes, we really just see flexion extension. And then there really is nothing here. There's no coronal plane movement. Um, or transverse plane movement. So remember that on the other document that I put up on on your um, on Canvas for you folks, oops, is this guy over here. So this was, let me make sure that that's in your sh screen sharing window. Um, hopefully you can, oh, maybe you can't see that. Here, let's try it, darn it. Okay, sorry, there we go. So here's uh, flexion extension of the knee and then a bit of internal rotation and then dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. These are the muscle groups that do it. Inversion and eversion and then the muscles of the toe. And that wraps up the upper and lower extremities. Uh, well, that wraps up the lower extremities for, for this particular video.